Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Before we dive into Larry Stroman's Tribe Number 1, some news. Ed will be in Japan for Tokyo Comic Con at the end of November, so check him out there along with Jeff Darrow sharing a table. Talk about a good setup. Also, Cartoonist Kayfabe videos are brought to you by the comics that we make. Ed Piscor's Red Room Trigger Warnings and Red Room the Antisocial Network are now in stores everywhere. These are four completely self-contained stories that you can read in any order. So whichever volume you come across first is the perfect place to start on Red Room. My latest is Hulk Grand Design Monster Madness. The comic books are out now. The oversized Treasury Edition will be out in early 2023, but you got to pre-order that one now. And Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live, back in print after almost a year from Image Comics. Get this one wherever you pick up comics. And speaking of Image Comics... Tribe by Larry Stroman and Todd Johnson. And uh, you can see I've got Todd Johnson's signature on my copy, but I don't have Larry Stroman for some reason, which is uh, BS. The uh, I've seen Larry Stroman sign it. And I, uh, he only is it signed inside here. He only signs it on the inside cover, of a very specific. Wonder place. why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, legendary signature often uh, written across this inside front cover. I wish I could offer that here today, but I can't. But what I'll say about Tribe is this is like your as soon as Image Comics starts. Yeah. This is 1993, the following year, and part of that second wave coming off of X Factor. Whenever they relaunched all those X books, with Jim Lee's X Men number one being the most prominent. I loved Strowman's take on sure. X-Factor. That was a revelation for me. That was the first time I had seen his art, and it looked so different than everybody else. It did not look like he was looking at the same people coming up. Not at all, man. Like, Egon Schiele, the Aeon Flux-looking shit for sure. This book, I would love to know numbers. Uh, it had to sell zillions, because when the market implodes and Kmarts have the multi-packs, there really weren't that many image comic like hollow foil shiny covers yes. and this would be the front of multi-packs you know what i mean like this is ubiquitous and then when people start getting hold of it at my school with a big booty like forget about it like everybody got it just for the inside yes. cover I, I i don't know how i feel about this cover i think it looks good on screen and I always associate this book and these creators with being a little more design conscious. You'll see stuff kind of uh, names of designers in their credits and things. Yeah. And the cover looks really cool like this, but man, I want to see Stroman art. This is iconic, and I'm going to prove it. Hang tight for one second. All right. So, I mean, so many of these things came out that, like, that, you know, that is iconic to me. So whenever I was doing, like, my, my image style <laughs> zine thing, like, flip it on the back... Like, oh, I, yeah. like, like I had to go gold and just like with the emboss and all that shit, totally based on, um, that's sweet. The tribe vibe. And this is Dan Klaus, uh, cre created that piece. Yeah. That's amazing. But it's totally, I, I assume this tribe. is what you referenced to, uh, Gary Groth when you're like, yeah, we'll do the foil embossed, uh, cover. I mean, dude, like the whole bit, like when, it, like I made sure to put Gary Groth's name in here as many times <laughs> as possible because he was like, Ed, what the fuck am I publishing here? <laughs> I'm like, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's so good. I'm going to make you some money, Uncle Gary. Don't worry about it. Yeah, but over time, I mean, it is. it has become somewhat iconic to me. You know, I'm sure people will talk about finding this in, in 50 cent bins and dollar bins because, yeah. like you say, they printed a lot of these books. 93, things were still in that full-on expansion mode. I think these guys are set up. I like. I don't think Larry Stroman has really worked since. Um, That's interesting. Um, Kyoto on coloring. Yeah. It's one of the colorists that I really think stands out from this era. Totally. With all the optics color separation. So just this smooth transition, it's hard to describe, but like, this is like the best of computer coloring of that time. And I'm assuming we're going to just take a quick look at like the future issues mm -hmm. also. And you're going to see how it drops off immediately. Like all the optics and the guys who come from all the optics are the best of this cut, cutting edge color because everything else, everybody else at the time was really playing catch up. Steve Olaf, the Ollie and Ollie Optics, had such a leg up on everybody from uh, his month after month tenure on the Akira um, epic series right. from Marvel. So he had the leg up on everybody when it came to computer color separations, and he got to see month after month after month how it's those colors point. translated, so he beat everybody. 
That's a really good point. And to your, uh, you know, like this gradation, calling it the best, we've looked at some gradation from this era, and what we would see are things like going from purple to yellow or orange, you know, a complementary color, and you get a gray in the middle. What you've got to do is go from purple into like your magenta so that you don't have complementary colors creating that gray, and that's what you see here. Go from your purple, get rid of the cyan, and then you can bring in your yellow, and no harm, no foul. Yeah. So... The art in this book, I like it. I think this is Stroman. All the stuff that I like about Stroman is on here. I have no idea who any of these characters are, what, who's good guys, bad guys, what the conflict is. It's so confusing for me from a story standpoint. Yeah, like these dudes, they knew that, they, that there was going to be a lot of copies of this. So the important thing, you know, they're, this is the most entrepreneurial first effort I've seen of probably any comic and that includes Todd McFarlane's spawn because he did not have Todd toys and all that shit set up in fucking issue one. Well you can keep going because there's no story here. I didn't read it. Like like I was like, okay, I'm gonna read it for the first time. Like I had it. I tried to read it a million times. I'm actually gonna read it. I quit. I got bored as fuck. But when you see our dudes with like shirts and hats on, like they're adorning all this like fly fashion and you notice it in the body of the comic. Like, oh okay man, he's like decking these dudes out in like pretty cool shit there's like scenery like you know the sets that are important and then when you get to the end and you see that you could buy the hat that the dude is wearing you could buy the shirt that the dude is wearing uh you could buy the the hype club fucking shirt like these dudes realize that they're in the business of being able to sell these pamphlets at a couple hundred thousand if not a million so Add a couple of things, more things that people can buy. And if you get 1% of those, you know, 200, 400,000 people to buy a shirt, you're fucking set up even further now. Because, yeah, sure, royalties on a $1.95 comic that's selling in the hundreds of thousands, yeah, it's sexy. But what's the margin on a t shirt? You know, you're making eight bucks a shirt or something like that. Our big booty chick is starting to show up. And there would be stuff like the fixation my dudes would have with like a little nip slip. Mm -hmm. Like we'd never seen that. Yeah. And this is kind of the breakout. I think one of the breakout characters of this series. Oh, yeah. Like she's so identifiable from any one single image. But what you see here is like she's training right against this. I, I guess that's a small person. I think it's supposed to be. And whenever she goes into kick. He breaks into a bunch of these little <laughs> figures. And it's like, this book is just filled with these superpowered characters. The club scene is a guy who can just, like, remake the physical space. Remakes himself at one point, which makes it even harder to figure out, like, who's who and stuff. But then you get in and you start to see, like, oh, this is a super fast character. How do we do that? And you get that... Um, it's not exactly the... Uh, what's the effect? The, the, the DeLuca effect. Yeah, it's not exactly a DeLuca, but it is almost something you'd see in manga where it's like, how do I show 20 punches in yeah, one like, panel? Yeah, like Hera Tetsuo would do you that know? shit. It's, it's kind of cool to see that. It's just cool images. It's cool graphics to me. Yeah. All these different, almost like superhero tropes. You could almost see them as like, hey, Marvel, do you want to buy one of these characters? Like, this guy's super fast. This one it can split into different characters. So it's a world of, I think in interviews, whenever we covered this in like Wizard, he talks about how they could have 5 million or 500 of these characters running through the book. It's a cool idea. It sounds different than your average comics, but it makes for very hard, like I say, to follow. I can't name one of the characters from, no. this, from this cast. And that's the other thing too. Like, like if they had, now these guys are flying without a net. There's no editor unless they want there to be an editor. And that would mean they they're paying the guy. So... Now you have to have an editor that will stand up to you and speak truth to power. And none of these guys had that kind of shit. They're just doing their thing. Because there is a way to set this up with, with the entrepreneurial aspects that they have with all the rumbleware bullshit in the back. At least make a dude look cool doing some shit with your fucking rumble shirt. You know, like, like if you're going to sell it, because that's what it is. This is a catalog to sell shirts and shit because the comic is nothing. Then, then, you know, highlight some shit. Let's make a commercial. This is another one of those, like, how do you show this power? This is the guy who can recreate, remodel the club as he walks through and waves his hands. And you're starting to see, like, just the hint of it. Because he's going to disappear behind this sudden brick wall that appears whenever they come around the corner after him. That's your little indicator of, like, the superpower that he's initiating there to create a, uh, a false plane there behind him. Um, a lot of cool ideas, you know? It's just not... 
like I say, I can't follow the narrative. No, no. Like, I'd never heard of Todd Johnson. I, I'm assuming that it's a friend of Larry Stroman's, and they're like, let's... They, if Jim could bring... His, if Jim Lee can bring his uh, high school chum, right. Brandon Choi, in, into into the mixture, like I'm going to bring my home homeboy into into the mixture. I wonder about that a lot because like all of this stuff, if you look in the Indicia, it's both the, their names. Yeah. And it makes me think like, Stroman has a big, long career. Like we know he can draw. What is this guy? Like, what does he get tied to? I bought this book 100% for Larry Stroman. I'm yeah. talking about it now 100% because of Larry Stroman's yeah. drawings. And I just wonder, like, how that split works and how much uh, equity, you know. Comics is it could, is a lonely biz, man. And and uh, to bring your homie along and, like, make a comic and to, like, enjoy that time, that could be worth 50% to Larry Stroman, you know? Yeah. Yeah, whenever you're cutting up a big a big paycheck, that's all right. But years later, if you want to reprint this or revisit it or reshape it or anything, it might make it a little bit more complicated. That's true. Love this kind of like vertical page layouts, which again, like it's all visual spectacle for me in terms of what I'm responding to. But even the color palette feels a little bit different. You're getting some of these tertiary oranges and greens and purples. It's true. Something a little different than your standard, and, uh, you know, like a Wildcats, like a Jim Lee and, primary and colors. And this um, spread to me, is a Joe Chiodo spread because he wasn't afraid. He was the only dude in that era that wasn't afraid to use some pinks because it was such a macho, butch time. Right. Like, Joe Chiodo would use these kind of colors, this kind of green, you know, and, and you would have, like, the whole kind of Easter egg palette across the, the pages. Like, I'm I'm not the best, but I could kind of... I, I can identify Chiodo. I could identify Ruben Rude. And I know when Steve Olive is the guy, like actually, like working on the page. There's those pinks you're talking about, Ed. Yeah, man. Turn the page. It's you. Uh, good timing on that. <laughs> Just the way he would build figures, so oddball. This is another one of those pretty fun early digital color effects, right? It's like Predator, and I think I feel like Predator's referenced in one of these, like in an interview or something, in terms of this effect. But it is that early digital coloring. Like, what can you do with this? How can you show uh, the invisible character effect? with what we've got now in terms of technology. It's such a good setup too, in terms of the gun and all the directional devices going after this, like the big character that we've seen established, but we've got one more hero coming in. So it's not as simple as I finally got the drop on you. Or villain. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Not positive who's who. And it's funny because I do think it relates to the entrepreneurial stuff. Like you almost have these superheroes moving in on like organized crime in this region, but it, it just doesn't quite, I, again, I can't tell you who who's involved with who, which is a shame because you know, it, it does make me think like you've got an ensemble cast built here. If I could just follow exactly who's trying to do what. I'd, I'd be interested. I'd be in. Yeah, yeah. It's so not about that. Like, and I'm looking at some of the stuff on the back inside cover here. Like, like coming up with that tribe logo. Like, it really that it, it works on a shirt. That's what that's what these dudes are in there for. You got to have a 22 page comic ahead to just have something to sell to people. Yeah. Again, you can see these kinds of powers, right? This is a guy who's like wiping people's minds and, and stuff by staring through their eyes. Second time we've seen that power used, but. Not sure that's a good guy. Going through this whole issue, uh, one of the things that came to mind that I, it called me crazy, but um, I just never really associated Walt Simonson with him that much. Mm. But yeah, there's some there. There's a lot of Simonson that I saw like in the artwork in here. And then retroactively, like looking at the um, X Factors, it's like no brainer. Absolutely. I just didn't have that language in mind, you know, when I was eight right. or whatever. Mark Texera, whenever he's coming to Image with uh, Union. Yeah, these guys are they're they're the same they're the same level, you know. Like like you had, to, call, like, you had to say B lister, but but yeah. like you have your McFarland, Lee Liefeld, and then you had like the next dudes who had interesting visuals that weren't those that first round. Of I image liked dudes. those guys so much. And yeah. It was probably because at some point you've looked at the Image guys a bunch, and now it's like I want to see these other these other drawing I, uh, techniques and influences. And you know who these two have in common is Neil Adams. Like, yeah. both of these two spent some time in continuity studios. It's true. It's true. Now, this is what it's all about, dude. Fucking cards already. Like, that's the world we live in where, like, oh, yeah. a 22-page comic yields a whole card set. And it's so fucked up that, that they the ad is even wrong. Eight cards per pack, 36 cards per box. No, yeah. 36 packs per box. Right. 12 boxes per case. So they're, like, trying to 
press you to buy a fucking case. How many case. people are buying cases of these things? Holy shit, collect all 90 cards to get the whole story. So it's it's that uh, Defiant Comics bullshit? I looked up a tribe hat on, on eBay yeah. this week. I, I didn't find one, but uh, uh, I was looking for one. These are fun. They have these thanks uh, notes in the back of, I think, all of these issues. And uh, very quickly, I'm just going to show... I think this is a complete run of all the Tribe comics published. So issue one, we've all seen it everywhere. After Image, and I don't know if it was a delay between issue one and two is how they break out away from Image, but for whatever reason, they're cut loose and they head to Axis Comics. I think this one is Axis. Yeah, like, and if you look in here, like... Yeah, you can see the logo on the back here. Their business is called Axis. Okay, that makes sense. Like, like it might be, it might be the, sh the shirt shit back here. Um, but the word access is used in tribe one in, in certain places. You can see a little difference in terms, I think, of color and line work. Still good drawing in this one. Very fine lines, though, and the fine lines, um, sometimes I think they have trouble with, like, overprinting of colors and things like that. But it still mostly works for me a little bit dark on some of the colors, which is probably the mark of not having a, uh, All the optics, a, a seasoned man. color separator, right? This was one of those iconic images for me in this series, and it's probably just because it illustrates how much of a nerd I was at this time. <laughs> All right, so the reason that I wanted to pull this one out is whenever you're going through, like, who are we going to thank here? Professional assists, Daniel Klaus. That's an interesting <laughs> name to see back there. I wish we would have had that, uh, if I'd have been aware of that and asked ask Klaus when we interviewed him, like, what's the connection there? You know, if it's guys just talking shop at conventions or something like that. And uh, issue three, again, kind of playing out this axis thing. And what I would note on this one, I think it's different coloring, by the way, for every single issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it's all coming out of their pocket. So it, it's like try to get the best work that you can at the cheapest rates. You get some, some money shots of our uh, our main superheroine here delivering some flying kicks. She she makes me think of like, uh, do you remember Marsha Warfield from uh, Night Court? She was like one of the bailiffs. Like like okay. there was there was Bull Vaguely. the bald guy, and then and then Marsha War Warfield. She had a t talk show at the time also. Larry Stroman drawing a uh, beefed up dragon. If you'd have told me that was Mark Texera layouts on that on that drawing, I would have uh, there's believed you. Yeah, there's Texera elements to That's what wild. Stroman has been doing. I love his uh, yeah his his line work and stuff. He was not copying anybody else. And now the reason that I point this out, this is what Axis is publishing. Hero Illustrated did like an Axis uh, Ashcan kind of zine that would preview these things. Javier Salteris from yeah. uh, Ghost World is what I would have known. Or Ghost, Ghost, Rider. Ghost Rider is what I knew him from at the time. But you can see kind of the books that they were publishing. So was, I don't know if all of these actually came out or not, but at least uh, I think Beasties, at least I have a copy of that one. Yeah, because it's on the number two. Yeah, I would get this one confused with um, like Black me. Ball, which I think is where Trencher went yeah. to Black Ball, which was the same deal where it's like these image comics would shake loose and what are you going to do with it? And then finally, this is the last issue that I have. This is a zero, but this is marked as a volume two, and it's 1996. So this chronologically would have been the last one to come out. He's got an inker here. Um, again, you know, different colorists. And now we're not even on the uh, the glossy paper stock anymore. And I think you can see the coloring. 96, a couple years into the future, and it's almost like the coloring has regressed. Right. Also, it looks like Stroman is inking with some much heavier tool. I don't know if that's a maybe a big marker or something like that, but evolution over time. So, yeah, um, Tribe, really interesting comics. Yes, sir, man. And, I, and I wish we had more Larry Stroman comics. Jim, you better nail it with the thumbnail, if you know what I'm saying, man. <laughs> There's what, only one thumbnail. What can I do for a thumbnail that would stand out here? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll do my best on this. Good to go? I am. Okay, favors like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Tell the people what's out there, man. Hulk Grand Design, Monster Madness is in comic shops now in comic book form. In early 2023, the Treasury Edition collection of Hulk Grand Design will be out. Big oversized book, 40 extra pages, fluorescent green on the cover. The only way you can miss it is if you don't pre-order it now at your local comic shop. Street Angel Deadly Squirrel Live is back in print from Image Comics. Eight complete full-color stories in this one. And uh, 
some of my best comics to date. So pick that one up in time for Christmas for uh, the action comics fan in your life. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see a lot more of my comics and art. The comics that I have on the stands right now is uh, Red Room, The Antisocial Network, and Red Room, Trigger Warnings, Trade Paperback. Uh, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in uh, Red Room Comics. Uh, each book contains four complete stories complete stories with uh, a bunch of additional material in the back of each uh, and I'm serializing uh, new comics uh, on uh, my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. So all this is up there plus the new stuff, three bucks get you the archive and I will be at the Tokyo Comic Con uh, at the end of November sharing a table with Uncle Jeff Darrow. You know I'm bringing a blank sketchbook and I'm going to ask him to help me solve all the drawing challenges <laughs> that I've had my entire life. That's fantastic. Can't wait for that. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, mugs, fanny packs, whatever you might want this upcoming holiday season at our spread shop in the links below this video. It's another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy, we'll be on our way. Read more comics.